Welcome, Van Runner. A couple of months ago, I made a video looking at five failed consoles that never made it out of Japan, and it did rather well. So that got me thinking, and around a month later, I delivered a follow-up in the form of five failed consoles that never made it out of Europe, and rather unexpectedly I may add, that did even better, in fact it's now the most watched video on my channel with over 50,000 views and counting. In the comments of that video, one of my subscribers somewhat prophetically predicted a further follow-up that would look at five failed consoles that never made it out of America. He even named the quintet of systems that he thought would feature. I did somewhat hint that he had stolen my thunder, and here we are with that exact video. However, I actually have some different ideas when it comes to the consoles I can feature in such a list, and I immediately knew he was incorrect in his assertion that the only five that fitted the criteria were the ones he listed. And, not to blow my own trumpet, I do think that my selection is a little bit more interesting while still including the obvious choices. I don't want to spoil the video for you at this early juncture, so that's all I'll say on my selections for now. In many ways, the move to this region is perhaps the most interesting and the most important, because the American continent is by far the biggest market for video games and where many of the most influential and important companies that pioneered the industry were founded. In fact, many would argue that the United States in particular is the birthplace of video games and it's hard to disagree with that statement. So for any Western company launching a console, success in America would always be their goal and making a mark there can make or break you. Now that we've discussed and dissected the finer details of this video, it's time to get to the meat of the matter and look at those five failed consoles that never made it out of America. <coughs> The most earth-shattering dig dunk. Super system. The most realistic joust. Super system. Pole position at its hair-raising best. Super system. Only on the Atari 5200 Super System. Now at its lowest price ever. Real sports baseball. You're out. 2600 games. The adapter plays them all. The Atari 5200 Super System and all the exciting new games now at a new low price. Super system. Let's start off with the most obvious of them all then, shall we? I bet if you ask somebody to name a console that stayed in America, the poor old Atari 5200 would be the first one to get mentioned. I'm not going to go to the story of the so-called super system in too much detail here, because I've already covered it to death on this channel. So if you want to know more, I highly recommend checking out my amazing facts video on the console, which I will link in the comments. But I will give you a brief overview of the 8-bit console, and tell you why it failed in this way. Released in 1982, the Atari 5200 Super System was the follow-up to the market-leading Atari 2600 video computer system, and was set to go up against another arcade-orientated console in the form of the ColecoVision, released the same year. Rather than designing a completely new console from scratch to compete with Coleco, Atari took the easy route and just produced a consoleized version of their existing Atari 400 computer which rather ironically, was originally designed as a console anyway. But building a console around existing and already three year old hardware wasn't their biggest mistake. The ridiculous, non-centering analog controllers were. The huge size of the console and lack of genuine system exclusives didn't help matters much either. Not long after the 5200 debuted, it was reported that the console would also be released in Europe the year after. But the combination of unfortunate events put pay to those plans. Firstly, there was the system struggles in the marketplace, which was compounded further by the North American video game crash, and then the subsequent reorganising of Atari, which eventually resulted in the consumer division being sold to Jack Trammell. Then there was also the development of the 7800 Pro system, created precisely to fix all the issues with the 5200, including the controllers and lack of backwards compatibility. Finally, there was the fact that the European market was dominated by low-cost home computers, which led directly to the development of the Atari 600 XL, a reduced cost and smaller size version of the new 800 XL computer designed with Europe in mind. And next up we have another console that I've given a fair bit of love on this channel in the form of the Bally Personal Arcade, as it was originally known. 
It's also another system that starred in its very own Amazing Facts episode. Again, I've linked that video in the description. So like the 5200 before it, I won't be going into too much detail on this one either, for the same reasons. As many will know, Valley Midway were the oldest coin-op manufacturer in the world, and dominated arcades across America. So when the young, upstart Atari arrived and immediately ate into their market share, they knew they had to up their game. After getting wind of the upcoming Atari video computer system, Bally set Nutting Associates to work on adapting their own arcade hardware for home use. The result of that, as you probably guessed already, was the Bally Astrocade, which debuted on the market in 1978, less than a year after Atari's system. Being based on state-of-the-art arcade hardware, the Astrocade very much had the edge in terms of audio, sprites, memory and expandability. However, all this power came at a cost with a retail price of $299, which is nearly $1,500 in today's money, which was also $100 more than Atari's console, it seemed a lot less appealing to consumers. Slow sales led to Bally abandoning the console just two years after its release, with a new company known as Astrovision taking control of the distribution, development and marketing of the now renamed Astrocade. This takeover had a number of different effects on the system's fortunes, including the renaming of many of its games, due to the need to form new licensing agreements, and the removal of Bally Midway's vast distribution channels. This included a potential release in Europe, where the Chicago-based company had started experiencing success with their arcade games, including the likes of Pac-Man, Space Invaders and Wizard of War. Astrovision didn't have the capital or contacts to launch outside of America, and any hopes of raising the money to do so were killed by slow sales and the impending North American video game crash of 1983. America, yeah, by far the most obscure console on this list, the APF Imagination Machine was released in late 1979 to compete with the market leading Atari 2600 VCS. The Imagination Machine was very notable for being one of the first consoles that could be expanded to turn it into a fully fledged home computer, and this was very much its main selling point over its competition, which also included the likes of the Mattel Intellivision, Magnavox Odyssey 2, which also had limited computer functions, and the aforementioned Bally Astrocade, which also offered a computer upgrade later on. The APF M1000 console itself could be connected to the IM1 computer module, which then transformed it into the full APF imagination machine. And this set could then be connected to host for other compatible devices such as disk drives, printers, and even a modem. Obviously, this made the whole package very expensive. In fact, the full APF imagination machine originally sold for around $599 which is equivalent to around $2,300 in today's money. When you also consider that the hardware was also pretty underwhelming when compared to its rivals, this really didn't seem like good value for money, and early sales were almost non-existent. The unpopularity of the Imagination Machine meant that only 15 cartridges were ever released for it, including exciting titles such as Budget Manager, Shoot and Doodle. Believe it or not, an upgraded version of the console was planned, provisionally called the M2000. APF sadly went out of business before it was even finished. The success of the Atari 2600, as well as the arrival of low-cost colour home computers like the Atari 400 and Commodore VIC-20 very much doomed it to failure. The only handheld console on this list, the Sega Nomad, was developed as the replacement for the Game Gear, and followed suit by being based on existing home console technology. But the Nomad went one better, as rather than simply being based around the same hardware as the Game Gear was with the Master System, this new portable was fully compatible with the Sega Genesis. This was something NEC had already done several years before with their Turbo Express handheld, which was fully compatible with all Turbo Graphics 16 Q cards. The first interesting thing to note about the Sega Nomad is that the handheld was specifically designed for the American market, a first for Sega, who had previously debuted all of their systems in their homeland of Japan. This perhaps seems quite strange, but it's worth noting that the Mega Drive wasn't particularly successful in Japan, being dominated by both the PC Engine and Super Famicom. By October 1995, when the Nomad was released, Sega had stopped releasing new Mega Drive games in Japan altogether. 
just supporting the console in Western markets where it had been incredibly successful. So with that in mind, it's not really a surprise that the Nomad debuted in the USA. Almost as soon as it was announced, the Sega Nomad seemed like a winner. As a fully portable Sega Genesis, it already had a huge library of games, a great screen, and a really cool six-button design. But one very big problem became immediately apparent, the terrible battery life. It was reported that the Nomad was lucky to go beyond two hours of play on a fresh set of batteries, making the expensive and rather bulky battery packs an essential purchase partially negating the reason for buying a portable in the first place. It was also pretty expensive too, at $180. In comparison, a regular Sega Genesis console could be bought for around half the price. The Nomad did nothing to stop the Nintendo handheld juggernaut and soon became an expensive oddity. It was officially discontinued in 1999, but had already been dumped by most retailers long before that. But despite the Nomad's failure in the American market, it's still very surprising that Sega never released the console in either Europe or South America, where the Mega Drive was the market leader. It just seems incredibly short-sighted not to explore those extra revenue streams. But this was also the time that Sega went into freefall, making a number of catastrophic mistakes, including the development of the 32X and the botched design and launch of the Saturn. So I guess we shouldn't really be that surprised. Now, for our last entry on this list, I'm going to be looking at something very different indeed, as the Zebo is the only console on this list to originate from South America. Being released in both Brazil and around six months later in Mexico too in 2009, it's also by far the most recent console in this video too. In fact, Zebo was the first home console to be launched without any support for traditional media such as cartridges or CDs. All games had to be downloaded from the internet. The initial plan for the Zebo was to design a console for developing markets that would be low cost, simple to manufacture and offer a range of basic multimedia functions including internet browsing and video playback. The initial concept was drawn up by Rinaldo Normond, who was then heading up the mobile gaming division at Tectoy in Brazil, but he needed additional backing to bring his project to life. That came to him after a meeting with Mike Wan, the Senior Director of Games and Services at Qualcomm who had been exploring similar concepts. They co-founded Zebo Inc. in San Diego, California to fully develop the product. Tectoy in Brazil would handle all the manufacturing and marketing for the console, who many will already know had extensive experience in the gaming sector as the official producer of all Sega products in that region, with Zebo Inc. continuing development of the hardware and wooing new partners. It was soon reported that the likes of Capcom, Activision, Disney Interactive, Data East, EA and Namco were interested in developing games for the console, and a number of high profile games were even announced too, including the likes of Double Dragon, Crash Bandicoot, Tekken 2, FIFA, Resident Evil 4 and Need for Speed. Many of these were conversions of the existing mobile phone games. The Zebo seemed like a great concept with the low cost and ability to download games using phone networks as well as regular internet connections. And there was clearly some pretty high profile support for it too. So what went wrong? Well, people first noticed that something was wrong when leading American communications company AT&T pulled out of a deal to help launch the product in further markets, as subsequent launches in both China and Russia were cancelled. It seemed that despite its sub $200 price point and a large range of well-known games, the market just wasn't ready for a digital-only console. And Zebo also greatly underestimated the cost of the download model in regions where having an internet connection of any kind was still somewhat of an expensive luxury. The Zebo was quietly discontinued in May 2011 with a message sent out to all users stating that support for the console had ended, but the Zebo Net server would stay online until the end of September. Zebo still maintained that new products based on the same concept were in the pipeline on their own official website, but nothing more ever materialised. <laughs> Zibo tem internet sem precisar de computador, baixa games incríveis e acessa sites que ajudam na escola. Tudo isso por 299 reais. Zibo, onde tudo acontece. 
And that completes my deep dive into five failed consoles that never made it out of America. Are there any others you can think of that should have made the list? Or are you lucky enough to own one of these obscure oddities and want to tell us more about it? As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts and views in the comments, so please get typing. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons and YouTube members for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Brady Haynes, D Vaughan, Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, Dots Gamer Man, Sonic Mania 999, Paul Daniel, Paul Metcalf, Retro Resolution, Matt Standish, James Taylor, Ozzy B, 8 Bit Guy, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the lad, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.